But the U.S. Senate is about to gavel in to start their day. First up, general speeches until 11 o'clock this morning. And more work is expected on fiscal year 2012 defense programs. The final vote on the measure is possible later today. And now live to the Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we look to you this day for help. Without your help, our senators can see the ideal but cannot reach it. They can know the right, but cannot do it. They can seek the truth, but cannot fully find it. They can recognize their duty, but cannot perform it. Empowered by your might, help them to reach beyond guessing to knowing and beyond doubting to certainty regarding your purposes. We pray in your loving name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., December 1st, 2011 to the Senate under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Jeff Merkley, a Senator from the State of Oregon, to perform the duties of the Chair, signed Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. The Majority Leader. Following Leader remarks, the Senate will be in morning business till 11 a.m. this morning. Following that morning business, Senate will resume consideration of the Defense Department Authorization Bill. This will be a post-cloture debate. We expect complete action on the Defense Bill today. We'll may give everyone as much notice as we can when we have votes that are coming. Additionally, yesterday I filed cloture on a motion to proceed to S-1917, middle class tax cut. If no agreement is reached, this vote will be tomorrow morning. There are six measures, Ms. President, at the desk due for a second reading. The clerk will read the titles of the measures for the second time in block. SJ Res 30, joint resolution extending the cooling off period under Section 10 of the Railway Labor Act and so forth. SJ Res 31, joint resolution applying certain conditions to the dispute referred to in Executive Order 13586 and so forth. SJ Res 32, joint resolution to provide for the resolution of the outstanding issues in the current railway labor management dispute. S 1930, a bill to prohibit earmarks. S. 1931, a bill to provide certain payroll tax relief to reduce the federal budget deficit and for other purposes. S. 1932, a bill to require the Secretary of State to act on a permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. I would object to any further proceedings in regard to these matters. 
Objection having been heard. The measures will be placed on the calendar. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that Tiffany Griffin, who is a fellow in Senator Bingman's office, be granted floor privileges during today's session of the Senate. Without objection. I also ask unanimous consent that Roger Yang, uh, a member of Senator Merkley's staff, be granted floor privileges today. Without objection. Mr. President, yesterday on the Senate floor, my friend, the Republican leader, said he supports an extension of payroll tax cut that was enacted last year. There's been an extreme change of heart here on Sunday shows. The assistant leader, my friend, the junior senator from Arizona, said Sunday, not a chance they would work to extend this payroll tax cut. And then as late as Tuesday, my friend, the Republican leader, said that it wouldn't do a thing to help the economy. So obviously there's been a change of heart since then by the leaders of the Senate Republicans. But I noted yesterday that my friend was very careful to say only that he supports existing cuts, not that he supports our plan to cut taxes for 160 million American workers in every business in the country. And last night I found out why. I was disappointed to see Republicans' alternate proposal was actually a backdoor route to protect the very rich while shortchanging the middle class and small businesses. Should we be surprised at this, Mr. President? That's what's been going on this past year. Our proposal would provide relief for working families and expand existing tax cuts to benefit businesses. The Republican proposal rejects this new tax relief. It doesn't provide a penny of additional tax cuts for working families. And it does nothing for small businesses, the job creators, Republicans claim to care so much about. They seem to think that our plan to put $1,500 back in the pocket of every American, with rare exception, and give small business the boost they need to hire new employees goes too far. They're willing to fight for ever deeper tax cuts for the wealthy. But when it comes to the middle class, Republicans here in the Senate, not Republicans generally, but Republicans here in the Senate, believe the status quo is good enough for struggling families. The Republican plan goes directly against the budget agreement we reached in the summer, the so-called budget, budget Deficit Reduction Act, where we raised the debt ceiling and those things that took three months that we worked on. Their plan goes directly against that agreement that we made, which is now the law of this country. And while Democrats have been working tirelessly to create new jobs, the Republican plan goes in precisely the opposite direction. Instead of creating jobs, it would cost jobs. The report is out today that during the month of October, there were 206,000 private sector jobs created, Mr. President. Under their plan, the Republicans' plan, many more middle class families around the country would lose their jobs. That includes Americans dedicated to public service. Hardworking people committing to keep our streets safe, for example, an FBI agent, drug enforcement officer, food safety workers, highway construction workers. They want to devastate those folks. That's how they want to pay for this tax cut. It's not anything that's going to help the economy. It hurts the economy. They're going after jobs that we need so desperately. Do the Republicans really believe, I guess so, because that's what their legislation is all about, that the way to revive the economy is to lay off more FBI agents? or fire more Border Patrol officers. These cuts won't revive the economy. They'll only slow it down and cost even more jobs. But remember, the role of the Republicans here in the Senate is to defeat Barack Obama. It doesn't matter what it does to middle class families, obviously. While targeting the middle class, Republicans propose to do nothing to cut back on excessive subsidies for many large corporations that benefit from government contracts. Mr. President, this is this is almost hard to comprehend. During the Republican, it started, and it's, boy, I'll tell you, it, is, it, they, it caught fire during the uh, Republican control of the presidency. Government contractors. There are more than five million of them. And they propose, the Republicans propose to do nothing to cut back on excessive, excessive subsidies 
for many of these large corporations that benefit from government contracts. Employees at some of these taxpayer-supported corporations are being paid more than $700,000 a year, while many public servants struggle to make ends meet. The Republicans want to whack these people who work to keep us safe in many different ways, while they let these people go untouched. The Republicans are uninterested in going after these high income earners. As usual, the only real target of this Republican meat axe is the American middle class. It's wrong. Americans believe across the country that the middle class is hurting. And, Mr. President, I've said, I'll say it again. The only people in America who believe that the richest of the rich shouldn't contribute just a little bit to help our economy are the Senate Republicans. Republicans outside this body don't feel that way. America's middle class has been hurting for a long time. They're the people who are struggling. They're the ones who need help, not these multimillionaires and not large, profitable government contractors. So, Mr. President, the Republican proposal is unacceptable. It won't pass the Senate. We can do better, and we must do better. With this, Chair announced the business of the day. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will now be in a period of morning business until 11 a.m., with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. With the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the majority controlling the first half and the Republicans controlling the final half. The Senator from Washington. Mr. President, uh, I come to the floor this morning to urge my colleagues to support the middle class tax cut bill that would extend and expand the payroll tax relief for our families and small business owners. This legislation is straightforward. It should not be controversial. At a time when so many of our hardworking middle class families are continue to struggle in this very tough economy, this bill would cut their Social Security payroll tax in half from 6.2 percent to 3.1 percent. That means a tax cut for 160 million workers in this country today. In my home state of Washington, it represents a tax cut of around $1,700 for a family earning the median income next year. And this bill would put money into the pockets of small business owners and encourage them to hire workers by cutting the employer side of the payroll tax in half as well and eliminating it altogether for firms who are making new hires. In Washington State, 150,000 small business owners would receive a tax cut under this plan and they would have thousands of dollars more in their pockets to spend in their communities and get workers back on the job. Mr. President, this is a big deal. Economists from across the ideological spectrum have said payroll tax cuts create jobs and boost the economy. And they have said it could be devastating to allow them to go up in this weak economy. In the past, Republicans have agreed and have strongly supported payroll tax cuts as an effective way to boost the economy and create jobs. So this should be easy. It should be something that both parties can get behind and quickly pass. But unfortunately, it seems that policy, politics seem to be getting in the way. I'm disappointed that many of the same Republicans who spent the last few months fighting tooth and nail to prevent tax increases on the richest Americans and biggest corporations are now hesitating to give average working families a break. In fact, it was this very issue that prevented the Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction to come to a deal. On the Democratic side, we put forward serious compromises on the table to get to a balanced and bipartisan deal. But our Republican counterparts refused to allow the wealthiest Americans to pay a single penny in taxes and insisted that the middle class and seniors and most vulnerable Americans bear the burden of this crisis alone. It wasn't fair then, not fair now. This bill is fully paid for by asking millionaires 
who earn more than a million dollars a year to pay just a little bit more. Just a small step towards a fair share. It's not drastic. It doesn't close the loopholes and shelters that Republicans have been fighting hard to maintain. It doesn't touch the Bush tax cuts for the rich that they have been protecting. It doesn't end the tax breaks for the oil and gas industry that they wouldn't allow us to close. Simply adds a 3.25% tax on incomes over a million dollars a year. That means if someone earns $1.2 million in a single year, they only owe an additional 3.25% on that last $200,000. At a time when so many families are struggling, we think this is a fair thing to ask. For the wealthiest Americans who survived well over the last few years to contribute in order to give working families a break. So, Mr. President, this vote sets up a simple choice. Do you vote to extend critical tax cuts for middle-class families and small businesses who've been struggling in this economy, or do you vote to protect the wealthiest Americans from paying one penny more towards their fair share? I know where I stand. I feel very strongly that we owe it to middle-class families across our country to extend this tax cut, and I think it would be a whole lot easier if our Republican colleagues were as focused on tax cuts for the middle class as they are on those for the wealthiest Americans and corporations. So I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and extend tax cuts for the families who really need them most. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President, the Republican leader. <clears throat> Yesterday, uh, Republicans led by Senator Heller introduced what we believe is a much smarter approach to extending the temporary payroll tax cut than the one proposed by Democrats involving permanent tax hikes on job creators. Like Democrats, we think struggling American workers should continue to get this temporary relief for another year. There's no reason folks should suffer even more than they already are from the president's failure to turn his, his jobs crisis around. But there's also no reason we should pay for that relief by raising taxes on the very employers we're counting on to help jolt this economy back to life. We wouldn't be helping anybody by making it less likely that small businesses actually start hiring people again. So Senator Heller's proposal would achieve the same result, the same relief, without a gratuitous hit on job creators. Even better, our plan protects Social Security and reduces the federal deficit by more than $111 billion. How do we do it? Well, consistent with the recommendations of the bipartisan Simpson-Bowles Commission, our payroll tax plan would institute a three-year pay freeze on federal civilian employees, including members of Congress. It would also reduce the federal workforce gradually by 10 percent, not by firing anybody, but by only hiring one replacement for every three federal employees who leave federal service. Until a 10 percent reduction that the Simpson-Bowles Commission recommended is reached. So over this period, only hire one worker for every three who leave, which until it achieved a 10 percent reduction in the federal workforce. This is a <clears throat> recommendation in the Simpson-Bowles uh, Commission. Our bill would also save money by means testing Medicare benefits for millionaires and billionaires. What does that mean? Well, one of the things the economic downturn of the past few years has revealed is that a lot of people out there are getting a pretty good deal from the government at every level, all on the taxpayer's dime. Let me give you an example. Yesterday, a CBS affiliate in Philadelphia reported that a former Philadelphia school superintendent who got a nearly $1 million buyout in August is now putting in for unemployment benefits. 
The lady got shown the door, got $905,000 not to finish her five-year contract with the school district, and on top of that, she now wants the taxpayers to subsidize her unemployment benefits to the tune of about $30,000 a year. Our proposal helps minimize this kind of thing. Now, what we're saying is that anybody who makes more than a million dollars a year shouldn't be getting an unemployment check on top of it, paid for with tax dollars of folks struggling just to make ends meet. No more unemployment checks or food stamps for millionaires. No more unemployment checks or food stamps for millionaires. And we don't think these folks would mind having to pay the full freight on their Medicare premiums either. Millions of seniors need covering their monthly Medicare premiums. Warren Buffett isn't one of them. And here's another way things, uh, <clears throat> folks like Warren Buffett can help offset the relief we're giving working Americans through this temporary extension of the payroll tax cut. Our proposal also incorporates legislation from Senator Thune that would allow people who want to voluntarily help pay down the federal debt to do so on their tax return. There would actually be a new line right on Warren Buffett's tax returns, enabling him or anybody else for that matter who gives us, uh, to give as much as they want. That way, those who want to go that route can feel like they're contributing in a way that they want to contribute, and small business owners who want to help our economic and fiscal situation by growing their businesses and creating jobs can do that too, without Washington dictating one way or the other. Now, this is the kind of balanced plan Americans are looking for. It's focused on helping middle-class Americans without asking them to fund benefits for the wealthiest among us, and it does so without hamstringing the economy, as the Democrats would, with a permanent tax on job creators. Bear in mind, what they're doing here is, quote, paying for a temporary payroll tax relief with a permanent tax increase on job creators. And it also helps rein in the bureaucracy in Washington. Millions of Americans have had to go without or to live with less over the past few years, yet all they see here is that Washington just keeps getting bigger and bigger and richer. It's about time Washington took the hit for a change. So we think this is a plan that those who are fed up with Washington and Wall Street can embrace. But as I've said before, we're never going to turn this economy around as long as we're focused on these temporary measures. Yesterday, I outlined our vision for a tax reform plan that restores basic fairness, helps put businesses on a level, a level playing field, and puts our tax rates in line with our competitors overseas. Now, that's the kind of thing that will get this economy charging again, and we'll continue to press for it. Meanwhile, we'll also continue to point out the things this administration is doing to prevent job creation right now. Yesterday, Republicans drew attention to one of the greatest fumbles of this administration yet. This is an astonishing thing, Mr. President. I don't know how many Americans are familiar with the proposed Keystone XL pipeline, but this is an issue every single American is soon going to learn a lot about. The Keystone XL pipeline is the single largest shovel-ready project in our entire country the single largest shovel-ready project in our entire country. It would transport oil from Canada, our friendly neighbor to the north, to the Gulf Coast. It is privately funded, so it wouldn't cost the taxpayer a dime. And we're told that its approval would lead to the creation of 20,000 jobs, not some other time, but immediately, right now. This project is enormous. It is a huge job creator, and it's ready to go. Labor unions love this project. Folks in the heartland love this project. The Chamber of Commerce loves this project. But here's the problem. President Obama is getting heat from his base over this project, especially from the very young and very liberal voters he'll need knocking on doors before November. 
So the State Department now says they're going to delay the approval, even though previously they were seemingly ready to approve it after a three-year review that's already occurred, including two exhaustive environmental evaluations. So here's the bottom line. The President has said time and time again that his top priority is jobs. Yet, here we've got the single largest shovel-ready project in the country ready to go, ready to go, and he's delaying its approval, interestingly enough, until after the election next year. He's saying he doesn't care so much about jobs in states like Nebraska that he doesn't think he'll carry next year so he can keep the enthusiasm up in states he hopes to carry. So I think it's pretty clear the President cares less about this particular boon for job creation than his own job preservation. And it's wrong. There's no reason whatsoever to delay this project and these jobs by another day. As the President recently put it, we've got to decide what are our priorities. We've got to ask ourselves what's not just best for me, but what's best for us. What's the best way to grow the economy and create jobs? That was President Obama who said that. And that's why Republicans are proposing legislation today that would require the President either to approve, approve this massive job-creating project within 60 days or to explain clearly why he doesn't think it's in the national interest to do so. Give the President 60 days, not after next year's election, but 60 days to decide why this shouldn't be approved and explain it to us. We think the people who want to start hiring deserve action or a straightforward explanation from the President himself as to why he opposes it. Get this pipeline going right now, Mr. President, or get out of the way. Uh, I yield for. Mr. President. The Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to speak about the issue of job creation and also uh, supporting our small businesses and strengthening our economic recovery. One of the, the fundamental questions that I've been asked in Pennsylvania, and I think most uh, senators on both sides of the aisle have been asked repeatedly, not just in the last couple of days or weeks, but for many, many months now, is a very fundamental question. What are you doing as a member of the United States Senate uh, to create jobs, or to at least create the conditions uh, under which jobs will be created? What are, you, what are you doing in your votes, in your advocacy, in your, in your fight in Washington for jobs? What, what does that mean? And uh, sometimes we have a, a better answer than other times. Today, and certainly in the last couple of days, and I think we'll be debating this for a number of days uh, moving forward, and, and that's a good thing, we will have a better answer to that fundamental question. What are you doing as a public official to create jobs in America? One of the ways that we can uh, kickstart the economy and get job creation moving in the right direction again is by passing legislation like the legislation that I've introduced, the Middle Class Tax Cut Act. It's now before the Senate, as the presiding officer knows, and we've been talking about it already, but we've got more work to do on this today and some voting to do today on this legislation. The legislation is fully paid for and will accomplish two important objectives. Number one, it will strengthen the economy uh, to support uh, middle-income families, and specifically the way we do that is by providing middle-income families with a tax cut, a cut in the payroll tax, which uh, uh, means take-home pay, uh, that will help make ends meet for that worker and that family, but will also have uh, an impact by boosting demand throughout our economy. Secondly, we'll cut payroll taxes for small businesses, helping them to grow and to create jobs. 
Here's what most people are, are confronting. Not just the big numbers, uh, more than 14 million people out of work across America. In Pennsylvania, where the latest number from October was 500,000, more than 500,000 people out of work. Uh, 513,000 to be exact. Uh, people out of work. That number has fluctuated. Thank goodness it started to go below half a million, but then it, it bumped up again to about almost 525,000. So it's a little away from that number. But when a half a million people are out of work in the state, uh, you can just imagine the hurt that families are feeling, the, the lives of struggle and sacrifice uh, in our midst. And that's why we've got to do something to jumpstart the economy and to create jobs. I think the American people also want us to do this in a bipartisan way. And we can and we should. We came together at the end of 2010, passed a tax bill, which was bipartisan. There are elements of that bill that one side and the other did not like, and vehemently so. But we came together in a bipartisan way to pass a tax bill at the end of last year. We need to do the same thing on a payroll tax cut. So we need to work together, Democrats and Republicans, and get a result for the American people. And this is something we can do right now. Not six months from now, not a year from now, right now to help our families and to create jobs. And there is broad agreement that more needs to be done to support uh, the economic recovery. We've got to create more jobs. We've got to kickstart the engine of economic growth. While the economy has added nearly 2.8 million private sector jobs in the past 20 months, we continue to face significant economic challenges. Unemployment across the country, as we all know, is still at about 9 percent. And long-term unemployment remains at record levels, with four out of every 10 unemployed workers having been jobless for six months or more. We know the gross domestic product, so-called GDP, grew at less than, less than 1 percent. Uh, an annual rate in the first half of the year. So for the first six months of 2011, uh, less than 1 percent uh, growth. The third quarter of gross domestic product growth was recently revised downward. Initially they said 2.5, that was re revised downward to just 2. So it's, it's self-evident that we need to do something right now about jobs. We've got a weak labor market and only modest economic growth this year. So it's clear we, we've got to do more and we've got to act right now. Payroll tax cuts and credits are powerful tools to increase job creation and provide economic relief for middle-income families. The current 2 percent payroll tax cut for working Americans that's in place now has played an important role in sustaining the economic recovery. By the end of this year, 121 million families will have received an average tax cut of more than $930 based upon last year's action that we took to cut the payroll tax. That was a good decision, uh, but if anything we need to, to continue that and also expand it, and I'll explain that as I go forward. The number of families benefiting from this current payroll tax cut is very large because anyone who receives a paycheck benefits from a cut in payroll tax. Uh, anyone who receives a paycheck gets this cut. Cutting payroll taxes immediately increases the take-home pay of everyone uh, who gets a paycheck. Compared to reducing the tax rates for the top 1 percent of the American people, more money goes to middle and lower income Americans who are likely to spend it if, if we keep uh, the payroll tax cut in place and of course we want to expand it as well. This additional spending that goes into the pockets because uh, take-home pay is greater, people have more money in their pockets, and as I said, more than 930 bucks this year. This additional uh, take-home pay will result in more spending. When we spend at that level, and, and a lot of families are spending more, especially in the holiday season, that boosts demand for goods and services, and that leads to job creation. This is not theory. This is not some uh, untested theory or, or, uh, or hope. We know that this works. We did it in 2011. We've got to do more of it in 2012. The employee side of this, and I'll divide this into employee and employer for a second. The employee payroll tax cut expires at the end of this year, as I mentioned. Without congressional action, 
employees' share of the payroll tax will return to 6.2 percent of earnings, up from the current 4.2 uh, level. So you've got a payroll tax that's been cut from 6.2 to 4.2. That's in place. But if we do nothing, if we don't act, if we don't pass an extension of that, that 4.2 will go up to 6.2, and it'll be a tax increase for families across the board. If we fail to act, these middle-income families will see their payroll tax cut disappear at the end of this year. Let me say that again. If we don't act by the end of December, middle-income families will lose this payroll tax cut that's in place now. So what does this mean? Well, it means basically losing between 900 bucks and 1,000 bucks. And this is take-home pay for workers and their, their families. And this is a very tough time for those families, as I mentioned before, with high unemployment and so many stresses, economic uh, stresses and pressure on their lives. Families who are already facing both declining wages and stubbornly high unemployment, families who are struggling to pay for housing, make car payments, uh, pay, pay the food bill, uh, paying for college tuition, whatever it is, whatever in their lives it means uh, making ends meet, they're having a terribly difficult time still. Losing this tax cut would also undermine the recovery by reducing consumer spending. Numerous economists and forecasters have highlighted the dangers to the economy of allowing this payroll tax cut to expire. Independent analysts estimate that letting the 2% employee tax cut expire would reduce gross domestic product growth by up to two-thirds uh, of a percent in 2012. Uh, Mark Zandi um, from Moody's, in, in a, uh, an article uh, from September the 9th of 2011 entitled, An Analysis of, the, uh, of President Obama's Jobs Plan, uh, made that same point. You, you, don't, you don't continue the payroll tax cut, and you have an adverse impact on economic growth. Goldman Sachs Global Research, uh, ECS Research, uh, had a similar uh, conclusion. So this isn't just about individuals losing a payroll tax cut that's in place now. This is about harming, in a very adverse way, our economy's ability to grow uh, in a substantial way. Uh, so let me talk for a moment about the legislation before us, the, the Middle Class Tax Cut Act that I introduced. First of all, it would... The Senator's time has expired. What, let me ask consent for another five minutes. Is there an objection? Thank you very much. Objection. Let me talk for a moment about the legislation. Uh, the legislation before us, as I said before, would both extend and expand the, the uh, uh, payroll tax cut that's in place right now. We, first of all, for employees, cut it in half. So instead of paying a 6.2 percent payroll tax, uh, the employee, the worker, would pay uh, just 3.1. It has a seismic impact on the economy when you do that. 1500 bucks in the pockets uh, of, of uh, the average uh, worker in America. 160 million American workers impacted in Pennsylvania uh, as much as 6.7 million. So we would not only keep in place the tax cut for workers, the payroll tax cut, but we want to expand it uh, so it's fully cut in half. Uh, secondly, I, I wanted to talk for a moment about the employer side of this, because that wasn't part of last year's uh, effort. I introduced a payroll tax credit in early 2010 to encourage workers to hire and expand, or hire and accelerate, I should say, the pace of the recovery. Uh, a number of folks on both sides of the aisle have worked on this, and uh, that the ideas and those kinds of tax credits, those kinds of bills that we introduced, form the foundation of what we're trying to do today. This legislation incorporates elements of my and others' uh, earlier legislation to provide businesses with quarterly incentives to increase their payrolls. I want to highlight uh, a couple of elements of, of the legislation before us. First, this bill cuts payroll taxes in half for 98 percent of U.S. businesses. These businesses have taxable payrolls of, of $5 million or less. They'll see their payroll taxes cut, as I said before, for the worker uh, in half, as well as for the businesses. So some people would say, okay, that's 98 percent of businesses. That's good news. What about the other 2 percent who have higher uh, income? Those businesses that have taxable income above 
uh, $5 million, they will still get uh, a payroll tax cut from uh, 6 2 to 3.1 on the first $5 million of their taxable uh, payroll. So they get it up to that level. So this is a huge benefit to small businesses across the country and even some uh, businesses larger than that. The Joint Economic Committee, the committee of, of which I'm a chair, just re, uh, reduced, uh, released, I should say, a report uh, that uh, indicated that small business lending remains well below pre-recession levels, both in the number of loans and the dollar value of those loans. So a lot of small businesses still cannot get access to credit. This payroll tax cut legislation uh, will help those, uh, those companies substantially to be able to have, get access to credit. Finally, I'd make a point about the legislation as it relates to eliminating the employer share of the Social Security payroll tax on the first 50 million of increased payroll in 2012. This isn't just a cut, this is an elimination. If they do one of three things, if they're hiring, hiring more, more workers, if they increase the hours, that's another way to get the benefit of this, and thirdly, if they, they're boosting pay. This is uh, legislation which is one of the best ways to create jobs, one of the best ways to, to kickstart our economy. And I'd conclude with this, Mr. President. If you look at this in the real world of uh, communities across Pennsylvania or across the country, what this means is if we pass this legislation um, for a median family income in Pennsylvania, the benefit is $1,535, a little more than 1500 bucks. So whether you go to small rural counties or big cities or suburban communities, wherever it is across a state like ours, workers will be able to put uh, 1500 bucks roughly in their pockets uh, for, this, um, for this season coming up when people need some help and small businesses will be substantially positively impacted by this legislation. We need to pass this legislation. We need to do it now to help our workers, to help our businesses, and to grow the economy and create jobs. Thank you, Mr. President. I would yield the floor. The Senator from Missouri. Mr. President, um, I have offered an amendment to the defense authorization bill that unfortunately we're not going to get a chance to vote on. But I want to begin talking about this because I think this is something that we need to do as we appropriate money uh, for our military for the next year. I want to start by saying I support the mission in Afghanistan. But after years of work on wartime contracting issues and looking at the way we have spent money uh, through contracting in both Iraq and Afghanistan, I have come to a stark and real conclusion about money that we have wasted and continue to waste in this effort. We are building infrastructure in Afghanistan that we cannot secure and that will not be sustained. Since 2004, the Defense Department, just the Defense Department, not the State Department, has spent more than $6.9 billion in Iraq and Afghanistan on humanitarian stabilization projects that include infrastructure, energy, and road construction. Primarily, this has occurred through what's known as the SERP Fund. SERP stands for Commander's Emergency Response Program. This began as an effort in the war against insurgencies, the counterinsurgency effort, the COIN strategy. This began as a good idea where the commanders on the ground would have money directly that they could access to do small neighborhood projects, to win the hearts and minds, to secure a neighborhood, to stabilize a community. These projects were envisioned when I first came to the Senate. We talked about fixing broken panes of glass in a shopkeeper's window. This program has morphed into something much different than what was envisioned at the beginning of the counterinsurgency effort in Iraq. These $100 projects, $1,000 projects, are now hundreds of millions of dollars. In fiscal year 2010, more than 90% of the spending on SERP were for projects over a half a million dollars. At its height in 2009, the authorizations for SERP 
spending in Afghanistan and Iraq reached $1.5 billion. And this is the kicker. The military building of large infrastructure projects has not shown a measurable impact on the success of our mission. I have stacks of studies, and I am such a wonk, I've actually read all of these studies. These are just a few of the studies that have been done by inspector generals, by special inspector generals, by the, the, I, the DOD inspector general, by the War Wartime Contracting Commission that Senator Webb and I uh, put into place uh, to look at all of the wartime contracting issues. Even our own troops have studied the expenditure of these funds. And I want to quote their conclusion in a recent study that was com completed by uh, the troops that are, in fact, fighting this effort in Afghanistan. Quote, despite hundreds of millions in investments, there is no persuasive evidence that the commander's emergency response program has fostered improved interdependent relationships between the host government and the population, arguably the key indicator of counterinsurgency success. I go on, a direct quote. The effectiveness of SERP in advancing our counterinsurgency objectives in Afghanistan has yet to be operationalized or well documented. The relationship between development assistance and counterinsurgency is being increasingly challenged in the academic and practitioner fields, with only unsubstantiated assertions and the occasional anecdote offered as a counterargument. There are no clear objectives for a program that funds everything from immediate emergency relief to multi-year, multi-million dollar road projects. The lack of proper incentives and accountability measures have rendered SERP and similar funds an extractive industry for construction companies, non-governmental organizations, and multiple Afghan government ministries fueling rather than fighting corruption, community insecurity, and insurgent coercion. Finding and defeating terrorists, fighting the Taliban, securing strategic victories against Al-Qaeda, training the Afghan mil Afghanistan military and police, all of these things I support. But this amount of money being spent on large infrastructure projects that cannot be sustained, we must end. In an unprecedented fashion, our military, not the State Department, has embarked upon these massive projects. This year, for the first time in this authorization, there is now a new Afghanistan Reconstruction Fund to get around the limits that have been placed on the size of projects in the SERP Fund. I call this fund the Son of SERP. It has now been documented that they want to go even larger and even bigger with these large multi-million dollar projects. I can't stand by as we spend billions on roads, electrical grids, bridges in Afghanistan, knowing the incredible need we have in this country for exactly that kind of investment. These projects are not being built in a secure environment. We're paying off people to try to keep the contractors safe. And it has been documented that some of that money has gone right into the hands of our enemy. Now, that must be stopped. These projects, in many, if most instances, cannot be sustained. And I can give a number of examples, but all you'd have to do is travel around Iraq and see the empty, crumbling health care centers built with American taxpayer dollars, the water park that is a twisted pile of rubble that is no longer operational, the, the, all of the investments that were made in oil production and electricity generation that were blown to bits. I can give specific examples in Afghanistan. How about a hundreds of millions of dollars spent on a power plant, the latest technology, dual fuel, and nobody there knows how to operate it and they can't afford to operate it. So it stands by as an empty, hulking potential generator for backup power while they buy cheaper electricity from a neighboring country. For the first time, the Department of Defense has requested and received $400 million in authorization in this new Afghanistan Reconstruction Fund. We should limit our military to the small projects that SERP was originally intended for. 
not produce contracts to major multinational corporations. All of these reconstruction funds should be pulled, and my amendment would do just that. We would pull all of this money out, with the exception of projects under $50,000. That would be as much as $700 million that we could immediately put directly into the Highway Trust Fund in this country. And that's what my amendment does. It will transfer that investment from a non-secure environment in areas these projects cannot be sustained to the very needy cause of infrastructure investment in the United States of America. Let's do this. Let's stop these large projects that cannot be secured and be sustained. Keep in mind, as much as $700 million would be pulled, and that is a small fraction of what we're spending in Afghanistan. The authorization for next year is more than $100 billion. So anyone who tries to say this will cripple our mission in Afghanistan doesn't understand the numbers. The monies we're spending in Afghanistan, the vast majority is about personnel to train the Afghan military, to train the Afghanistan Police Department to fight the terrorists that are there, the Taliban, uh, Al-Qaeda in the areas nearer Pakistan, all of that remains. A very small percentage of this would be pulled, but it should be pulled, and it should be pulled today, and we should take this investment and put it in roads and bridges right here in our country. Uh, I hope that this amendment will have success. When we look at the appropriations process, I think it's time that we stop this funding and stop it now. And I thank you, Mr. President, and yield the floor. Uh, Mr. President, the Senator from New Mexico. Mr. President, I wanted to take a few minutes to commend Dr. Donald Berwick for his service as administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and also to express my deep disappointment that his nomination was blocked by a minority of senators. CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS has benefited greatly from Dr. Berwick's innovation and leadership and the refusal of some members to support his confirming him for this position is difficult to understand. Dr. Berwick is widely recognized as a highly qualified leader in the realm of health care quality. Unfortunately, many of my colleagues across the aisle adamantly opposed Dr. Berwick's tenure beginning when he was first nominated by President Obama uh, for this position in April of last year. Many of these objections uh, are based on inaccurate accusations and sound bites that have been completely taken out of context. Dr. Berwick has the qualifications and exper expertise and demonstrated leadership ability that CMS needs at this critical time. He's a pediatrician by training, a Harvard professor, healthcare analyst, elected member of the Institute of Medicine, a leading advocate on health care quality and patient safety, and a co-founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which is a respected think tank that trains hospitals on how to increase patient safety and improve operations. Don Berwick's also written extensively, more than 120 scholarly articles uh, that he's authored or co-authored along with several books uh, on the quality and efficiency of health care. Dr. Berwick is a true visionary. He has been an advocate for transparency and accountability within our health care system, and his distinguished, distinguished career has made him the ideal candidate to lead the CMS at this critical time. It was due to Dr. Berwick's deep knowledge of health care, his vast experience, and his passion for this issue uh, that his nomination originally won praise from across the political and professional spectrum. This includes uh, Tom Scully uh, and Mark McClellan, both former administrators of CMS under President George W. Bush. They strongly endorsed his nomination. Uh, his nomination also had the support of Dr. Nancy Nielsen, 
vice, who is the past president of the American Medical Association, John Rother, who is the former executive vice president of the AARP and former Republican senator from Minnesota, our, our former colleague Dave Nuremberger. In fact, Newt Gingrich uh, even saluted Dr. Berwick for seeking a, quote, dramatically safer, less expensive, and more effective system of health care, end quote. During his tenure as CMS administrator, the few months that he has been in that position, Dr. Berwick has been able to implement impressive reforms, including launching the new CMS Innovation Center that will test new health care delivery models that emphasize primary care and innovative ways to finance health care. He's also instituted a financial incentives program for physicians who use electronic health records. And generally, he has set the tone for health reform to take root and to provide Americans with affordable, high-quality health care in a cost-efficient manner. To be perfectly clear, I am not in any way uh, suggesting that I do not uh, uh, continue to have enthusiasm for the President's recent nominee to replace Dr. Berwick. Uh, from all I know of this nominee, she will do an excellent job. But I am frustrated with an, that an eminently qualified public servant is being denied the opportunity to, conti to continue serving the American people in this important position. Uh, there's no valid justification for denying him that opportunity. The majority's time has expired. Uh, I would ask an additional minute. Uh, Is there an objection? Hearing none. Uh, John McDonough of the Boston Globe, in his commentary on the response to Don Berwick's nomination, wrote, quote, one of health care's most distinguished leaders and voices got mugged by partisan Republicans who know better and who got away with it, end quote. I'm truly disappointed that certain senators have pledged to block that, his nomination and that he has chosen to withdraw his or to resign his position effective tomorrow. Our task now is to assess the new nominee the President has sent us. I hope members can come together to do what is right in this circumstance, and that is to quickly confirm an administrator for this very important position. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, the Senator from Indiana. Mr. President, it's my understanding that um, I have 20 minutes of time allotted under morning business. Under the previous order, each senator has 10 minutes to speak. All right, Mr. President, uh, I, I don't think I'll use all those 20 minutes I might ask, for, or 10 minutes. I use the 10 minutes, but I, I may need to ask for some additional if it uh, works out uh, and others aren't waiting. Mr. President, I come to the floor uh, deeply disappointed, like many, uh, over our failure uh, to reach, uh, to seize uh, a unique opportunity uh, to put America on a more fiscally sane path for the future. My number one priority for this year, I've talked about it so many times, and uh, not only publicly but with colleagues in intense discussions uh, for now nearly a year, uh, that number one priority has been to advocate for a deficit reduc reduction package uh, that would be deemed credible and would put us on a path to fiscal stability. And I think given the situation that exists around the world today, nothing could have been uh, more impactful in a positive way than doing so. Uh, financial experts agreed, and they have for now uh, years, that we're on the wrong path, that we are spending far too much uh, in relationship to our uh, growth, anemic growth of GDP, uh, that we've staggered along here for three years and yet spent an extraordinary amount of money uh, without seeing the economy uh, recover. Uh, a number of plans have come forward. Uh, Simpson Bowles uh, uh, was promoted as one of those t bold types of plans that could help get us back on this uh, fiscal path to, uh, to uh, prosperity. Um, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Bowles was uh, the former chief of staff to our former president, uh, Bill Clinton, and uh, our former uh, colleague, uh, Alan Simpson, put together a package that 
uh, whether or not you agreed with it, uh, all of it, uh, certainly you could not disagree that this was something that didn't put us uh, on the path that we needed to go. Uh, yet that was uh, rejected out of hand um, uh, by, the, uh, by the White House and others. Uh, we've uh, seen the activities uh, and presentations of the Gang of Six, uh, 40 plus senators, including me, uh, uh, joined together bipart in a bipartisan way to urge the President to join us in coming forward with a bold, comprehensive plan. That was rejected. Uh, the President's budget was laughed out of this chamber. Not one person, either Democrat or Republican, voted for it. Uh, we came far short in August of what we needed to do. I wasn't able to support that particular plan. It did avert uh, a uh, debt limit increase uh, crisis. Uh, nevertheless, that opportunity, which we had with, with a uh, uh, involvement of both parties to do something truly significant, that, that was passed over. And so it then fell to, uh, fell to the, uh, gang, the uh, uh, committee of 12, which was called the Super Committee. And many of us, most of us, had input into that in terms of suggestions and, in, and what we urged uh, those members to do and to at least reach the minimum of $1.2 trillion of deficit reduction over a 10-year period of time. And there was a so-called draconian a sequester or across-the-board cut that would go into place automatically starting in 2013 if they couldn't come to agreement and the consensus at the time was this was so draconian that it would force an agreement on, and a coming together of Republicans and Democrats six of each three from the six from the House six from the Senate to come forward with at least a minimal plan many of us were urging them to do much more uh, to, to bring forth something that would be credible with the investment community and, and restore confidence that America understood the dire situation we were in and we were doing something about it as representatives of the people. No clearer message came to this body than the message sent in November of 2010 with the historic uh, turnover of members and uh, a, an outpouring of uh, support for putting the future of our country, our fiscal future and economic future and future for our children and grandchildren ahead of politics. And yet it is politics that defeated the effort. Now it's easy to you know, blame the committee of, of, of uh, 12. Uh, I know there was an earnest attempt to come together and politically uh, perhaps it was doomed from the start just by the way it was designed. At least I thought that way in August and was one of the reasons I voted against that that proposal. Nevertheless, they made an earnest attempt. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to bring it home. And so responsibility falls not just on those 12, but it falls on this entire Congress. Because we wouldn't even have gotten to that super committee of 12 if we had done our job earlier and presented in August when we were bumping up, uh, up against the debt limit extension, doing what I think most of us intuitively and, and, and understand needs to be done. And yet the political considerations and ramifications were such that uh, we came forward with a very timid and, and woefully short plan of what we needed, needed to do. Uh, the president has to take some responsibility. You can't really bring forward a, a bold change in the way the U.S. government does business unless you have bipartisan support. And you really can't get that bipartisan support unless the chief executive, the number one, the quarterback of the team, uh, stands up and says, I want to be involved and, and engaged and stay engaged. And while there was some rhetoric coming out of the White House, there was no plan. As I said, the budget plan was rejected on a unanimous vote. President's budget plan, unanimous vote. Republicans and every Democrat turned it down. Uh, the President said some nice words about what we needed to get going and so forth and so on, but he was AWOL. AWOL. Uh, as I said, the quarterback of the team needs to be engaged. I mean, he's the key person. And yet, uh, 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 that quarterback was not on the field. Uh, so Congress, uh, the White House, uh, I think some responsibility falls on outside groups who distorted what we were trying to do, who mischaracterized what Republicans were seeking to accomplish and 
some, there was some mischaracterization of what Democrats were seeking to accomplish, but it was an undermining process. Those groups that are supposedly representative of seniors across this country, this shameful, shameful way in which they distorted the message and what we were trying to do. And obviously it had a political impact here and, and, and put restraint on members because their base, their base was being told that uh, 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 they were lied to in terms of what was under consideration and what we were trying to do. We all know the Social Security and Medicare are going to f not have the funds available in the future to provide the services that were promised to the American people. And yet any attempt to try to salvage and save and retain those programs solvency, the message that went out from these groups that uh, supposedly represent the interests of, of our seniors uh, was such that, no, we were trying to take away their program. We were trying to destroy their program. I mean, how, how ridiculous it is that someone's going to come in here and say, my goal is to destroy retirement benefits for the American people, or my, I'm, real, I'm here to take away health benefits for American retirees. None of us are here for that purpose. These programs are in law. They are in place. We want them to be more efficient, more effective, but more importantly, we want them to remain solvent. And yet outside groups were basically sending just the opposite uh, message. And so we failed. We came up short. But having done so, we cannot avoid the responsibility that we continue to have to do everything in our power to try to address a very serious fiscal problem that exists in this country. Years and years, decades and decades, not only this Congress, but former Congresses, not only this President, but former Presidents have made promises to the American people which we are unable to keep because we are unable to sustain the fiscal capability of doing so. We haven't had a budget come out of the Congress in more than a thousand days. There's some indication that we will have a budget next year, and I sincerely hope that we can get together and come forward with a deficit reduction budget, one that uh, it recognizes the fiscal plight that we're in. And I'll work uh, with both sides of the aisle to try to accomplish that. We have to acknowledge that we continue to spend trillions of more dollars than we have available to us. No nation can sustain that. All you have to do is look across the Atlantic at what's taking place in Europe and country after country after country. It's not just Greece. It's not just uh, Portugal. It's not just Ireland anymore. It's Italy, and maybe, maybe France, and maybe other countries. The European Union is staggering for going forward to try to address a serious problem, the same type of problem that we have here. So the focus is there, and we look and say, oh, well, they need to get their act together. Well, we need to get our act together, because what we're seeing there may be coming across the shore here, and I, certainly the same principles in place promising more than you can deliver, borrowing more than you, so that you can pay debts that you don't have the money to pay for through the revenues that you generate in your country. The same thing is happening. And so all of this in front of us, seizing the opportunity to do something for the future of this country, our generation, the next generations, uh, the, for the sake of the country, uh, we need to continue the process and go forward. Uh, it's easy to sit around and grumble and blame somebody else and say, uh, well, we gave it our best shot and therefore we'll just let happen what happens. We don't want to do that because what will happen here if we continue on the course that we're on is what is currently happening in Europe. And we've, that's, there's no clearer picture of the consequences of a sovereign nation promising more and spending more than it takes in over time. It slows the economy. It piles up the interest payments, it shrinks the amount of money available for essential services, and it puts the programs that were in place in real jeopardy. So if we look at that, we clearly have to 